Chapter One of Prejudice's First Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prejudice's First Series by H. L. Mencken. Chapter One Criticism of Criticism of Criticism. Every now and then, a sense of the futility of their daily endeavors falling suddenly upon them, the critics of Christendom turn to a somewhat sour and depressing consideration of the nature and objects of their own craft. That is to say, they turn to criticizing criticism. What is it in plain words? What is its aim, exactly stated in legal terms? How far can it go? What good can it do? What is its normal effect upon the artist and the work of art? Such a spell of self-searching has been in progress for several years past, and the critics of various countries have contributed theories of more or less lucidity and plausibility to the discussion. Their views of their own art, it appears, are quite as divergent as their views of the arts they more commonly deal with. One group argues, partly by direct statement and partly by attacking all other groups, that the one defensible purpose of the critic is to encourage the virtuous and oppose the sinful. In brief, to police the fine arts and so hold them in tune with the moral order of the world. Another group, repudiating this constabulary function, argues heartily that the arts have nothing to do with morality whatsoever, that their concern is solely with pure beauty. A third group holds that the chief aspect of a work of art, particularly in the field of literature, is its aspect as psychological document, that if it doesn't help men to know themselves it is nothing. A fourth group reduces the thing to an exact science and sets up standards that resemble algebraic formulae. This is the group of metrists, of contrapuntists, and of those who gamble of light waves. And so, in order, follow groups five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, each with its theory and its proofs. Against the whole core, moral and aesthetic, psychological and algebraic, stands Major J. E. Spingarn, U.S.A. Major Spingarn lately served formal notice upon me that he had abandoned the life of the academic grove for that of the armed array, and so I give him his military title. But at the time he wrote his creative criticism, he was a professor in Columbia University, and I still find myself thinking of him not as a soldier extraordinarily literate, but as a professor in rebellion. For his notions, whatever one may say in opposition to them, are at least magnificently unprofessorial. They fly violently in the face of the principles that distinguish the largest and most influential group of campus critics. As witness, to say that poetry is moral or immoral is as meaningless as to say that an equilateral triangle is moral and an isosceles triangle immoral. Or worse, it is only conceivable in a world in which dinner-table conversation runs after this fashion. This cauliflower would be good if it had only been prepared in accordance with international law. One imagines, on hearing such atheism flying about, the amazed indignation of Professor Dr. William Lyon Phelps, with his discovery that Joseph Conrad preaches the axiom of the moral law. The, hey, what's that, of Professor Dr. W. C. Brownell, the Amherst Aristotle, with his eloquent plea for standards as ironclad as the Westminster Confession, the loud patriotic alarm of the gifted professor Dr. Stuart P. Sherman of Iowa, with his maxim that Puritanism is the official philosophy of America, and that all who dispute it are enemy aliens and should be deported. Major Spingarn, in truth, here performs a treason most horrible upon the reverend order he once adorned, and having achieved it, he straightway performs another and then another. That is to say, he tackles all the antagonistic groups of orthodox critics seriatim, and knocks them about unanimously. First the aforesaid agents of the sweet and pious, then the advocates of unities, meters, all rigid formulae, then the experts in imaginary psychology, then the historical comparers, pigeonholers, and makers of categories, finally the professors of pure aesthetic. One and all they take their places upon his operating table, and one and all they are stripped and anatomized. But what is the anarchistic ex-professor's own theory? For a professor must have a theory as a dog must have fleas. 
in brief what he offers is a doctrine borrowed from the italian benedetto croce and by croce filched from goethe a doctrine anything but new in the world even in goethe's time but nevertheless long buried in forgetfulness to wit the doctrine that it is the critic's first and only duty as carlyle once put it to find out what the poet's aim really and truly was how the task he had to do stood before his eye and how far with such materials as were afforded him he has fulfilled it for the poet read artist or if literature is in question substitute the germanic word dictor that is the artist in words the creator of beautiful letters whether in verse or in prose ibsen always called himself a dictor not a dramaticer or squeezebeller so i dare say did shakespeare well what is this generalized poet trying to do asks major spingarn and how has he done it that and no more is the critic's quest the morality of the work does not concern him it is not his business to determine whether it heeds aristotle or flouts aristotle he passes no judgment on its rhyme scheme its length and breadth its iambics its politics its patriotism its piety its psychological exactness its good taste he may note these things but he may not protest about them he may not complain if the thing criticized fails to fit into a pigeonhole every sonnet every drama every novel is sui generis it must stand on its own bottom it must be judged by its own inherent intentions poets said major spingarn do not really write epics pastorals lyrics however much they may be deceived by these false abstractions they express themselves and this expression is their only form there are not therefore only three or ten or a hundred literary kinds there are as many kinds as there are individual poets nor is there any valid appeal ad hominem the character and background of the poet are beside the mark the poem itself is the thing oscar wilde weak and swine-like yet wrote beautiful prose to reject that prose on the ground that wilde had filthy habits is as absurd as to reject what is man on the ground that its theology is beyond the intelligence of the editor of the new york times this spingarn croce carlyle goethe theory of course throws a heavy burden upon the critic it presupposes that he is a civilized and tolerant man hospitable to all intelligible ideas and capable of reading them as he runs this is a demand that at once rules out nine-tenths of the grown-up sophomores who carry on the business of criticism in america their trouble is simply that they lack the intellectual resilience necessary for taking in ideas and particularly new ideas the only way they can ingest one is by transforming it into the nearest related formula usually a harsh and devastating operation this fact accounts for their chronic inability to understand all that is most personal and original and hence most forceful and significant in the emerging literature of the country they can get down what has been digested and redigested and so brought into forms that they know and carefully labeled by predecessors of their own sort but they exhibit alarm immediately they come into the presence of the extraordinary here we have an explanation of brunel's loud appeal for a tightening of standards i e a larger respect for precedents patterns rubber stamps and here we have an explanation of phelps inability to comprehend the colossal phenomenon of dreiser and of boynton's childish nonsense about realism and of sherman's effort to apply the espionage act to the arts and of moore's querulous enmity to romanticism and of all the fatuous pigeonholing that passes for criticism in the more solemn literary periodicals as practiced by all such learned and diligent but essentially ignorant and unimaginative men criticism is little more than a branch of homiletics they judge a work of art not by its clarity and sincerity not by the force and charm of its ideas not by the technical virtuosity of the artist not by his originality and artistic courage but simply and solely by his orthodoxy if he is what is called a right thinker if he devotes himself to advocating the transient platitudes in a sonorous manner then he is worthy of respect but if he lets fall the slightest hint that he is in doubt about any of them or worse still that he is indifferent then he is a scoundrel and hence by their theory a bad artist such pious piffle is horribly familiar among us i do not exaggerate its terms 
you will find it running through the critical writings of practically all the dull fellows who combine criticism with tutoring. In the words of many of them it is stated in the plainest way and defended with much heat, theological and pedagogical. In its baldest form it shows itself in the doctrine that it is scandalous for an artist, say a dramatist or a novelist, to depict vice as attractive. The fact that vice, more often than not, undoubtedly is attractive, else why should it ever gobble any of us, is disposed of with a lofty gesture. What of it, say these birch men? The artist is not a reporter, but a great teacher. It is not his business to depict the world as it is, but as it ought to be. Against this notion American criticism makes but feeble headway. We are, in fact, a nation of evangelists. Every third American devotes himself to improving and lifting up his fellow citizens, usually by force. The messianic delusion is our national disease. Thus the moral private dozenten have the crowd on their side, and it is difficult to shake their authority. Even the vicious are still in favor of crying vice down. Here is a novel, says the artist. Why didn't you write a tract, roars the professor, and down the chute go novel and novelist. This girl is pretty, says the painter. But she has left off her undershirt, protests the headmaster, and off goes the poor dauber's head. At its mildest this balderdash takes the form of the late Hamilton Wright Maybe's white list of books. At its worst it is comstockery, an idiotic and abominable thing. Genuine criticism is as impossible to such inordinately narrow and cocksure men as music is to a man who is tone-deaf. The critic, to interpret his artist, even to understand his artist, must be able to get into the mind of his artist. He must feel and comprehend the vast pressure of the creative passion. As Major Spingarn says, aesthetic judgment and artistic creation are instinct with the same vital life. That is why all the best criticism of the world has been written by men who have had within them not only the reflective and analytical faculty of critics, but also the gusto of artists. Goethe, Carlyle, Lessing, Schlegel, St. Beauvé, and to drop a story or two, Hazlitt, Herman Barr, George Brandis, and James Hunnaker. Hunnaker, tackling also Sprock Zarathustra, revealed its content in illuminating flashes but tackled by Paul Elmer Moore, it became no more than a dull student's exercise ill-naturedly corrected. So much for the theory of Major J. E. Spingarn, U.S.A., late professor of modern languages and literatures in Columbia University. Obviously it is a far sounder and more stimulating theory than any of those cherished by the other professors. It demands that the critic be a man of intelligence, of toleration, of wide information, of genuine hospitality to ideas, whereas the others only demand that he have learning and accept anything as learning that has been said before. But once he has stated his doctrine, the ingenious ex-professor, professor-like, immediately begins to corrupt it by claiming too much for it. Having laid and hatched, so to speak, his somewhat stale but still highly nourishing egg, he begins to argue fatuously that the resultant flamingo is the whole mustering of the critical aves. But the fact is, of course, that criticism is humanly practiced, must needs fall a good deal short of this intuitive recreation of beauty, and what is more, it must go a good deal further. For one thing it must be interpretation in terms that are not only exact, but are also comprehensible to the reader, else it will leave the original mystery as dark as before, and once interpretation comes in, paraphrase and transliteration come in. What is recondite must be made plainer, the transcendental to some extent at least must be done into common modes of thinking. Well, what are morality, trochaics, hexameters, movements, historical principles, psychological maxims, the dramatic unities, what are all these, save common modes of thinking, shortcuts, rubber stamps, words of one syllable? Moreover, beauty as we know it in this world is by no means the apparition in vacuo that Dr. Spingarn seems to see. It has its social, its political, even its moral implications. The finale of Beethoven's C minor symphony is not only colossal as music, it is also colossal as revolt. It says something against something. Yet more, the springs of beauty are not within itself alone, nor even in genius alone, but often in things without. Brahms wrote his Deutsches Requiem not only because he was a great artist, but also because he was a good German. And in Nietzsche there are times when the divine afflatus takes a back seat 
and the Spirocotai have the floor. Major Spingarn himself seems to harbor some sense of this limitation on his doctrine. He gives warning that the poet's intention must be judged at the moment of the creative act, which opens the door enough for many an ancient to creep in. But limited or not, he at least clears off a lot of moldy rubbish and gets further toward the truth than any of his former colleagues. They waste themselves upon theories that only conceal the poet's achievement the more, the more diligently they are applied. He, at all events, grounds himself upon the sound notion that there should be free speech in art, and no protective tariffs, and no a priori assumptions, and no testing of ideas by mere words. The safe ground probably lies between the contestants, but nearer Spingarn. The critic who really illuminates starts off much as he starts off, but with a due regard for the prejudices and imbecilities of the world. I think the best feasible practice is to be found in certain chapters of Hunnaker, a critic of vastly more solid influence and of infinitely more value to the arts than all the pratting pedagogues since Rufus Griswold. Here, as in the case of Poe, a sensitive and intelligent artist recreates the work of other artists, but there also comes to the ceremony a man of the world, and the things he has to say are apposite and instructive too. To denounce moralizing out of hand is to pronounce a moral judgment. To dispute the categories is to set up a new anti-categorical category. And to admire the work of Shakespeare is to be interested in his handling of blank verse, his social aspirations, his shotgun marriage, and his frequent concessions to the bombastic frenzy of his actors, and to have some curiosity about Mr. W. H. The really competent critic must be an empiricist. He must conduct his exploration with whatever means lie within the bounds of his personal limitation. He must produce his effects with whatever tools will work. If pills fail, he gets out his saw. If the saw won't cut, he seizes a club. Perhaps, after all, the chief burden that lies upon Major Spingarn's theory is to be found in its label. The word creative is a bit too flamboyant. It says what he wants to say, but it probably says a good deal more. In this emergency, I propose getting rid of the misleading label by pasting another over it. That is, I propose the substitution of catalytic for creative, despite the fact that catalytic is an unfamiliar word and suggests the dog Latin of the seminaries. I borrow it from chemistry, and its meaning is really quite simple. A catalyzer in chemistry is a substance that helps two other substances to react. For example, consider the case of ordinary cane sugar and water. Dissolve the sugar in the water and nothing happens. But add a few drops of acid and the sugar changes into glucose and fructose. Meanwhile, the acid itself is absolutely unchanged. All it does is stir up the reaction between the water and the sugar. The process is called catalysis. The acid is a catalyzer. Well, this is almost exactly the function of a genuine critic of the arts. It is his business to provoke the reaction between the work of art and the spectator. The spectator untutored stands unmoved. He sees the work of art, but it fails to make any intelligible impression on him. If he were spontaneously sensitive to it, there would be no need for criticism. But now comes the critic with his catalysis. He makes the work of art live for the spectator. He makes the spectator live for the work of art. Out of the process comes understanding, appreciation, intelligent enjoyment, and that is precisely what the artist tried to produce. End of chapter 1. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 2 of Prejudices, First Series. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prejudices, First Series, by H. L. Mencken, the late Mr. Wells. The man as artist, I fear, is extinct, not by some sudden and romantic catastrophe like his own Richard Remington, but after a process of gradual and obscure decay. In his day, he was easily the most brilliant, if not always the most profound, of contemporary English novelists. There were in him all of the requisites for the business, and most of them very abundantly. He had a lively and charming imagination. He wrote with the utmost fluency and address. 
he had humor and eloquence he had a sharp eye for the odd and intriguing in human character and most of all he was full of feeling and could transmit it to the reader that high day of his lasted say from nineteen o eight to nineteen twelve it began with tono bungay and ended amid the last scenes of marriage as the well-made play of scribe gave up the ghost in the last act of a doll's house there in marriage were the first faint signs of something wrong invention succumbed to theories that somehow failed to hang together and the story after vast heavings incontinently went to pieces one had begun with an acute and highly diverting study of monogamy in modern london one found oneself toward the close gaping over an unconvincing fable of marriage in the stone age coming directly after so vivid a personage as remington dr richard godwin trafford simply refused to go down and his marjorie following his example stuck in the gullet of the imagination one ceased to believe in them when they set out for labrador and after that it was impossible to revive interest in them the more they were explained and vivisected and drenched with theories the more unreal they became since then the decline of wells has been as steady as his rise was rapid call the roll of his books and you will discern a progressive and unmistakable falling off into the passionate friends there crept the first downright dullness by this time his readers had become familiar with his machinery and his materials his elbowing suffragettes his tea-swilling london uplifters his smattering of quasi-science his intellectualized adulteries his Thackerayan asides, his textbook paragraphs, his journalistic raciness, and all these things had thus begun to lose the blush of their first charm. To help them out, he heaved in larger and larger doses of theory, often diverting enough and sometimes even persuasive, but in the long run a poor substitute for the proper ingredients of character, situation, and human passion next came the wife of sir isaac harman an attempt to rewrite a doll's house with a fourth act in terms of antebellum 1914 the result was five hundred odd pages of bosh a flabby and tedious piece of work wells for the first time in the role of unmistakable bore and then bealby with its palais royal jocosity its running in and out of doors its humor of physical collision its reminiscences of a trip to chinatown and peck's bad boy and then boone a heavy-witted satire often incomprehensible always incommoded by its disguise as a novel and then the research magnificent a poor soup from the dry bones of nietzsche and then mr britling sees it through here for a happy moment there seemed to be something better almost in fact a recrudescence of the wells of nineteen ten but that seeming was only seeming what confused the judgment was the enormous popular success of the book because it presented a fifth-rate englishman in an heroic aspect because it sentimentalized the whole reaction of the english proletariat to the war it offered a subtle sort of flattery to other fifth-rate englishmen and per corollary to americans of corresponding degree to wit the second thus it made a great pother and was hymned as a masterpiece in such gazettes as the new york times as blasco ibanez's the four horsemen of the apocalypse was destined to be hymned three years later but there was in the book in point of fact a great hollowness and that hollowness presently begat an implosion 
that disposed of the shell i dare say many a novel reader returns now and then to tonobonge and even to ann veronica but surely only a reader with absolutely nothing else to read would return to mr britling sees it through there followed what the soul of a bishop perhaps the worst novel ever written by a serious novelist since novel writing began and then or perhaps a bit before or simultaneously an idiotic religious tract a tract so utterly feeble and preposterous that even the scotchman william archer could not stomach it and then to make an end came joan and peter and the collapse of wells was revealed at last in its true proportions this joan and peter i confess lingers in my memory as unpleasantly as a summer cold and so in retrospect i may perhaps exaggerate its intrinsic badness i would not look into it again for gold and frankincense i was at the job of reading it for days and days endlessly daunted and halted by its laborious dullness its flatulent fatuity its almost fabulous inconsequentiality it was and is nearly impossible to believe that the wells of tono bungay and the history of mr polly wrote it or that he was in the full possession of his faculties when he allowed it to be printed under his name for in it there is the fault that the wells of those days almost beyond any other fictioneer of the time was incapable of the fault of dismalness of tediousness the witless and contagious coma of the evangelist here for nearly six hundred pages of fine type he rolls on in an intellectual cloud boring one abominably with uninteresting people pointless situations revelations that reveal nothing arguments that have no appositeness expositions that expose naught save an insatiable and torturing garrulity where is the old fine address of the man where is his sharp eye for the salient and significant in character where is his instinct for form his skill at putting a story together his hand for making it unwind itself these things are so far gone that it becomes hard to believe that they ever existed there is not the slightest sign of them in joan and peter the book is a botch from end to end and in that botch there is not even the palliation of an arduous enterprise gallantly attempted no inherent difficulty is visible the story is anything but complex and surely anything but subtle its badness lies wholly in the fact that the author made a mess of the writing that his quondam cunning once so exhilarating was gone when he began it reviewing it at the time of its publication i inclined momentarily to the notion that the war was to blame no one could overestimate the cost of that struggle to the english not only in men and money but also and more importantly in the things of the spirit it developed national traits that were greatly at odds with the old ideal of anglo-saxon character an extravagant hysteria a tendency to whimper under blows political radicalism and credulity it overthrew the old ruling caste of the land and gave over the control of things to upstarts from the lowest classes shady jews snuffling methodists prehensile commercial gents disgusting demagogues all sorts of self-seeking adventurers worst of all the strain seemed to work havoc with the customary dignity and reticence and even with the plain common sense of many englishmen on a higher level and in particular many english writers the astounding bawling of kipling and the no less astounding bombast of g k chesterton were anything but isolated 
there were in fact scores of other eminent authors in the same state of eruption and a study of the resultant literature of objurgation will make a fascinating job for some sweating privadozent of tomorrow say out of gottingen or jena it occurred to me as i say that wells might have become afflicted by this same demoralization but reflection disposed of the notion on the one hand there was the plain fact that his actual writings on the war while marked by the bitterness of the time were anything but insane and on the other hand there was the equally plain fact that his decay had been in progress a long while before the germans made their fateful thrust at liege the precise thing that ailed him i found at last on page two seventy two of the american edition of his book there it was plainly described albeit unwittingly but if you will go back to the other novels since marriage you will find traces of it in all of them and even more vivid indications in the books of exposition and philosophizing that have accompanied them what has slowly crippled him and perhaps disposed of him is his gradual acceptance of the theory corrupting to the artist and scarcely less so to the man that he is one of the great thinkers of his era charged with a pregnant message to the younger generation that his ideas rammed into enough skulls will save the empire not only from the satanic nietzscheism of the hindenburgs and post hindenburgs but also from all those inner weaknesses that taint and flabbergast its vitals as the tapeworm with nineteen heads devoured a therapist of macedon in brief he suffers from a messianic delusion and once a man begins to suffer from a messianic delusion his days as a serious artist are ended he may yet serve the state with laudable devotion he may yet enchant his millions he may yet posture and gyrate before the world as a man of mark but not in the character of artist not as a creator of sound books not in the separate place of one who observes the eternal tragedy of man with full sympathy and understanding and yet with a touch of godlike remoteness not as homer saw it smiting the while his blooming lyre i point as i say to page two seventy two of joan and peter whereon imperfectly concealed by jocosity you will find wells's private view of wells a view at once too flattering and libelous what it shows is the absorption of the artist in the tin-pot reformer and professional wise man a descent indeed the man impinged upon us and made his first solid success not as a merchant of banal pedagogics not as a hawker of sociological liver pills but as a master of brilliant and lifelike representation an evoker of unaccustomed but none the less deep-seated emotions a dramatist of fine imagination and highly resourceful execution it was the stupendous drama and spectacle of modern life and not its dubious and unintelligible lessons that drew him from his test tubes and guinea pigs and made an artist of him and to the business of that artist once he had served his apprenticeship he brought a vision so keen a point of view so fresh and sane and a talent for exhibition so lively and original that he straightway conquered all of us nothing could exceed the sheer radiance of tono bungay it is a work that glows with reality it projects a whole epoch with unforgettable effect it is a moving picture conceived and arranged not by the usual ex-bartender or chorus man but by an extremely civilized and sophisticated observer alert to every detail of the surface and yet acutely aware of the internal play of forces the essential springs the larger deeper lines of it in brief it is a work of art of the soundest merit for it both represents accurately and interprets convincingly and under everything is a current of feeling that coordinates and informs the whole 
but in the success of the book and of the two or three following it there was a temptation and in the temptation a peril the audience was there high in expectation eagerly demanding more and in the ego of the man a true proletarian and hence born with morals faiths certainties vasty gaseous hopes there was an urge that urge it seems to me began to torture him when he set about the passionate friends in the presence of it he was dissuaded from the business of an artist made discontented with the business of an artist it was not enough to display the life of his time with accuracy and understanding it was not even enough to criticize it with a penetrating humor and sagacity from the depths of his being like some foul miasma there arose the old fatuous yearning to change it to improve it to set it right where it was wrong to make it over according to some pattern superior to the one followed by the lord god jehovah with this sinister impulse as aberrant in an artist as a taste for legs in an archbishop the instinct that had created tono bungay and the new machiavelli gave battle and for a while the issue was in doubt but with marriage its trend began to be apparent and before long the evangelist was triumphant and his bray battered the ear and in the end there was a quite different wells before us and a wells worth infinitely less than the one driven off Today one must put him where he has begun to put himself not among the literary artists of english but among the brummagem prophets of england his old rival was arnold bennett his new rival is the fabian society or maybe lord northcliffe or the surviving chesterton or the later hilaire belloc the prophesying business is like writing fugues it is fatal to every one save the man of absolute genius the lesser fellow and wells for all his cleverness is surely one of the lesser fellows is bound to come to grief at it and one of the first signs of his coming to grief is the drying up of his sense of humor compare the soul of a bishop or joan and peter to anne veronica or the history of mr polly one notices instantly the disappearance of the comic spirit the old searching irony in brief of the precise thing that keeps the breath of life in arnold bennett it was in boone i believe that this irony showed its last flare there is a passage in that book which somehow lingers in the memory a portrait of the united states as it arose in the mind of an englishman reading the nation of yesteryear Quote, a vain garrulous and prosperous female of uncertain age and still more uncertain temper with unfounded pretensions to intellectuality and an idea of refinement of the most negative description the aunt errant of christendom End quote. a capital whimsy but blooming almost alone a sense of humor had it been able to survive the theology would certainly have saved us from lady sunderbund in the soul of a bishop and from lady charlotte sydenham in joan and peter but it did not and could not survive it always withers in the presence of the messianic delusion like justice and the truth in front of patriotic passion what takes its place is the oafish witless buffoonishness of the chautauquas and the floor of congress for example the sort of thing that makes an intolerable bore of bealby nor are wells's ideas as he has so laboriously expounded them worth the sacrifice of his old lively charm they are in fact second-hand and he often muddles them in the telling in first and last things he preaches a flabby socialism and then toward the end admits frankly that it doesn't work 
in boone he erects a whole book upon an eighth-rate platitude to wit the platitude that english literature in these latter times is platitudinous a three-cornered banality indeed for his own argument is a case in point and so helps to prove what was already obvious in the research magnificent he smooches an idea from nietzsche and then mauls it so badly that one begins to wonder whether he's in favor of it or against it in the undying fire he first states the obvious and then flees from it in alarm in his war books he borrows right and left from dr wilson from the british socialists from romaine rolland even from such profound thinkers as james m beck lloyd george and the editor of the new york tribune and everything that he borrows is flat in joan and peter he first argues that england is going to pot because english education is too formal and archaic and then that germany is going to pot because german education is too realistic and opportunist he seems to respond to all the varying crazes and fallacies of the day he swallows them without digesting them he tries to substitute mere timeliness for reflection and feeling and under all the rumble bumble of bad ideas is the imbecile assumption of the jitney messiah at all times and everywhere that human beings may be made over by changing the rules under which they live that progress is a matter of intent and foresight that an act of parliament can cure the blunders and check the practical joking of god such notions are surely no baggage for a serious novelist a novelist of course must have a point of view but it must be a point of view untroubled by the crazes of the moment it must regard the internal workings and meanings of existence and not merely its superficial appearances a novelist must view life from some secure rock drawing it into a definite perspective interpreting it upon an ordered plan even if he hold as conrad does in dreiser and hardy and anatole france that it is essentially meaningless he must at least display that meaninglessness with reasonable clarity and consistency wells shows no such solid and intelligible attitude he is too facile too enthusiastic too eager to teach today what he learned yesterday van wyck brooks once tried to reduce the whole body of his doctrine to a succinct statement the result was a little volume a great deal more plausible than any that wells himself has ever written but also one that probably surprised him now and then as he read it in it all his contradictions were reconciled all his gaps bridged all his shifts ameliorated brooks did for him in brief what william bayard hale did for dr wilson in the new freedom and has lived to regret it i dare say or at all events the vain labor of it in the same manner what remains of wells there remains a little shelf of very excellent books beginning with tono bungay and ending with marriage it is a shelf flanked on the one side by a long row of extravagant romances in the manner of jules verne and on the other side by an even longer row of puerile tracts but let us not underestimate it because it is in such uninviting company there is on it some of the liveliest most original most amusing and withal most respectable fiction that england has produced in our time in that fiction there is a sufficient memorial to a man who between two debauches of claptrap had his day as an artist end of chapter two recording by linda johnson chapter three of prejudices first series this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
prejudices first series by h l mencken arnold bennett of bennett it is quite easy to conjure up a recognizable picture by imaging everything that wells is not that is everything interior everything having to do with attitudes and ideas everything beyond the mere craft of arranging words in ingratiating sequences as stylists of course they have many points of contact each writes a journalese that is extraordinarily fluent and tuneful each is apt to be carried away by the rush of his own smartness but in their matter they stand at opposite poles wells has a believing mind and cannot resist the lascivious beckonings and eye-winkings of meretricious novelty bennett carries skepticism so far that it often takes on the appearance of a mere peasant-like suspicion of ideas bellicose and unintelligent wells is astonishingly intimate and confidential and more than one of his novels reeks with a shameless sort of autobiography bennett even when he makes use of personal experience contrives to get impersonality into it wells finally is a sentimentalist and cannot conceal his feelings bennett of all the english novelists of the day is the most steadily aloof and ironical this habit of irony in truth is the thing that gives bennett all his characteristic color and is at the bottom of both his peculiar merit and his peculiar limitation on the one hand it sets him free from the besetting sin of the contemporary novelist he never preaches he has no messianic delusion he is above the puerile theories that have engulfed such romantic men as wells winston churchill and the late jack london and even at times such sentimental agnostics as dreiser but on the other hand it leaves him empty of the passion that is when all is said and done the chief mark of the true novelist the trouble with him is that he cannot feel with his characters that he never involves himself emotionally in their struggles against destiny that the drama of their lives never thrills or dismays him and the result is that he is unable to arouse in the reader that penetrating sense of kinship that profound and instinctive sympathy which in its net effect is almost indistinguishable from the understanding born of experiences actually endured and emotions actually shared joseph conrad in a memorable piece of criticism once put the thing clearly my task he said is by the power of the written word to make you hear to make you feel it is above all to make you see here seeing it must be obvious is no more than feeling put into physical terms it is not the outward aspect that is to be seen but the inner truth and the end to be sought by that apprehension of inner truth is responsive recognition the sympathy of poor mortal for poor mortal the tidal uprush of feeling that makes us all one bennett it seems to me cannot evoke it his characters as they pass have a deceptive brilliance of outline but they soon fade one never finds them haunting the memory as lord jim haunts it or carrie meeber or huck finn or tom jones the reason is not far to seek it lies in the plain fact that they appear to their creator not as men and women whose hopes and agonies are of poignant concern not as tragic comedians in isolated and concentrated dramas but as mean figures in an infinitely dispersed and unintelligible farce as helpless nobodies in an epic struggle that transcends both their volition and their comprehension thus viewing them he fails to humanize them completely and so he fails to make their emotions contagious they are in their way often vividly real they are thoroughly accounted for what there is of them is unfailingly lifelike they move and breathe in an environment that pulses and glows 
but the attitude of the author toward them remains in the end the attitude of a biologist toward his laboratory animals he does not feel with them and neither does his reader bennett's chief business in fact is not with individuals at all even though he occasionally brings them up almost to life size what concerns him principally is the common life of large groups the action and reaction of castes and classes the struggle among societies in particular he is engrossed by the colossal and disorderly functioning of the english middle class a division of mankind inordinately mixed in race confused in ideals and illogical in ideas it is a group that has had interpreters aplenty past and present a full half of the literature of the victorian era was devoted to it but never i believe has it had an interpreter more resolutely detached and relentless never has it had one less shaken by emotional involvement here the very lack that detracts so much from bennett's stature as a novelist in the conventional sense is converted into a valuable possession better than any other man of his time he has got upon paper the social anatomy and physiology of the masses of average everyday unimaginative englishmen one leaves the long series of five towns books with a sense of having looked down the tube of a microscope upon a huge swarm of infinitely little but incessantly struggling organisms creatures engaged furiously in the pursuit of grotesque and unintelligible ends helpless participants in and victims of a struggle that takes on to their eyes a thousand lofty purposes all of them puerile to the observer above its turmoil here he seems to say is the middle the average the typical englishman here is the fellow as he appears to himself virtuous laborious important intelligent made in god's image and here he is in fact swinish ineffective inconsequential stupid a feeble parody upon his maker it is irony that penetrates and devastates and it is unrelieved by any show of the pity that gets into the irony of conrad or of the tolerant claim of kinship that mitigates that of fielding and thackeray it is harsh and cocksure it has at its moments some flavor of actual bounderism one instinctively shrinks from so smart alecky a pulling off of underclothes and unveiling of warts it is easy to discern in it indeed a note of distinct hostility and even of disgust the long exile of the author is not without its significance he not only got in france something of the frenchman's aloof and disdainful view of the english he must have taken a certain distaste for the national scene with him in the first place else he would not have gone at all the same attitude shows itself in w l george another englishman smeared with gallic foreignness both men it will be recalled reacted to the tremendous emotional assault of the war not by yielding to it ecstatically in the manner of the unpolluted islanders but by shrinking from it into a reserve that was naturally misunderstood george has put his sniffs into blind alley bennett has got his into the pretty lady i do not say that either book is positively french what i do say is that both mirror an attitude that has been somehow emptied of mere nationalism an italian adventure i dare say would have produced the same effect or a spanish or russian or german but it happened to be french what the bennett story attempts to do is what every serious bennett story attempts to do 
to exhibit dramatically the great gap separating the substance from the appearance in the english character it seems to me that its prudent and self-centered g j hope is a vastly more real englishman of his class and what is more an englishman vastly more useful and creditable to england than any of the gaudy bayards and sids of conventional war fiction here indeed the irony somehow fails the man we are obviously expected to disdain converts himself toward the end into a man not without his touches of the admirable he is no hero god knows and there is no more brilliance in him than you will find in an average country squire or parliament man but he has the rare virtue of common sense and that is probably the virtue that has served the english better than all others curiously enough the english reading public recognized the irony but failed to observe its confutation and so the book got bennett into bad odor at home and into worse odor among the sedulous apes of english ideas and emotions on this side of the water but it is a sound work nevertheless a sound work with a large and unescapable defect that defect is visible in a good many of the other things that bennett has done it is the product of his emotional detachment and it commonly reveals itself as an inability to take his own story seriously sometimes he pokes open fun at it as in the roll call more often he simply abandons it before it is done as if weary of a too tedious foolery this last process is plainly visible in the pretty lady the thing that gives form and direction to that story is a simple enough problem in psychology to wit what will happen when a man of sound education and decent instincts of sober age and prudent habit of common sense and even of certain mild cleverness what will happen logically and naturally when such a normal respectable cautious fellow finds himself disquietingly in love with a lady of no position at all in brief with a lady but lately of the town bennett sets the problem and for a couple of hundred pages investigates it with the utmost ingenuity and address exposing and discussing its sub-problems tracing the gradual shifting of its terms prodding with sharp insight into the psychological material entering into it and then as if suddenly tired of it worse as if suddenly convinced that the thing has gone on long enough that he has given the public enough of a book for its money he forthwith evades the solution altogether and brings down his curtain upon a palpably artificial denouement the device murders the book one is arrested at the start by a fascinating statement of the problem one follows a discussion of it that shows bennett at his brilliant best fertile in detail alert to every twist of motive incisively ironical at every step and then at the end one is incontinently turned out of the booth the effect is that of being assaulted with an ice pick by a hitherto amiable bartender almost to that of being bitten by a pretty girl in the midst of an amicable bus that effect unluckily is no stranger to the reader of bennett novels one encounters it in many of them there is a tremendous marshalling of meticulous and illuminating observation the background throbs with color the sardonic humor is never failing it is a capital show but always one goes away from it with a sense of having missed the conclusion always there is a final begging of the question it is not hard to perceive the attitude of mind underlying this chronic evasion of issues it is in essence agnosticism carried to the last place of decimals life itself is meaningless therefore the discussion of life is meaningless therefore why try futilely to get a meaning into it 
the reasoning unluckily has holes in it it may be sound logically but it is psychologically unworkable one goes to novels not for the bald scientific fact but for a romantic amelioration of it when they carry that amelioration to the point of uncritical certainty when they are full of ideas that click and whirl like machines then the mind revolts against the childish naivety of the thing but when there is no organization of the spectacle at all when it is presented as a mere formless panorama when to the sense of its unintelligibility is added the suggestion of its inherent chaos then the mind revolts no less art can never be simple representation it cannot deal solely with precisely what is it must at the least present the real in the light of some recognizable ideal it must give to the eternal farce if not some moral then at all events some direction for without that formulation there can be no clear-cut separation of the individual will from the general stew and turmoil of things and without that separation there can be no coherent drama and without that drama there can be no evocation of emotion and without that emotion art is unimaginable the field of the novel is very wide there is room on the one side for a brilliant play of ideas and theories provided only they do not stiffen the struggle of man with man or of man with destiny into a mere struggle of abstractions there is room on the other side for the most complete agnosticism provided only it be tempered by feeling joseph conrad is quite as unshakable an agnostic as bennett he is a ten times more implacable ironist but there is yet a place in his scheme for a sardonic sort of pity and pity however sardonic is perhaps as good an emotion as another the trouble with bennett is that he essays to sneer not only at the futile aspiration of man but also at the agony that goes with it the result is an air of affectation of superficiality almost of stupidity the manner on the one hand is that of a highly skilful and profoundly original artist but on the other hand it is that of a sophomore just made aware of haeckel bradlaugh and nietzsche bennett's unmitigated skepticism explains two things that have constantly puzzled the reviewers and that have been the cause of a great deal of idiotic writing about him for him as well as against him one of these things is his utter lack of anything properly describable as artistic conscience his extreme readiness to play the star houri in the seraglio of the publishers the other is his habit of translating platitudes into racy journalese and gravely offering them to the suburban trade as pocket philosophies both crimes it seems to me have their rise in his congenital incapacity for taking ideas seriously even including his own if this he appears to say is the tosh you want then here is another dose of it personally i have little interest in that sort of thing even good novels the best i can do are no more than compromises with a silly convention i am not interested in stories i am interested in the anatomy of human melancholy i am a descriptive sociologist with overtones of malice but if you want stories and can pay for them i am willing to give them to you and if you prefer bad stories then here is a bad one don't assume you can shame me by deploring my willingness think of what your doctors do every day and your lawyers and your men of god and your stockbrokers and your traders and politicians i am surely no worse than the average in fact i am probably a good deal superior to the average for i am at least not deceived by my own mountebankery 
I at least know my sound goods from my shoddy. Such, I dare say, is the process of thought behind such hollow trade goods as buried alive and the lion's share. One does not need the man's own amazing confidences to hear his snickers at his audience, at his work, and at himself. The books of boiled mutton philosophy and the manner of Dr. Orison Sweat Marden and Dr. Frank Crane and the occasional pot-boilers for the newspapers and magazines probably have much the same origin. What appears in them is not a weakness for ideas that are stale and obvious, but a distrust of all ideas whatsoever. The public, with its mob yearning to be instructed, edified and pulled by the nose, demands certainties. It must be told definitely, and a bit raucously, that this is true and that is false. But there are no certainties. Ergo, one notion is as good as another, and if it happens to be utter flubdub, so much the better, for it is precisely flubdub that penetrates the popular skull with the greatest facility. The way is already made. The hole already gapes. An effort to approach the hidden and baffling truth would simply burden the enterprise with difficulty. Moreover, the effort is intrinsically laborious and ungrateful. Moreover, there is probably no hidden truth to be uncovered. Thus, by the route of skepticism, Bennett apparently arrives at his soothsaying. That he actually believes in his own theorizing is inconceivable. He is far too intelligent a man to hold that any truths within the comprehension of the popular audience are sound enough to be worth preaching, or that it would do any good to preach them if they were. No doubt, he is considerably amused in petto by the gravity with which his bedizened platitudes have been received by persons accustomed to that sort of fare, particularly in America. It would be interesting to hear his private view of the corn-fed critics who hymn him as a profound and impassioned moralist with a mission to rescue the plain people from the heresies of such fellows as Dreiser. So much for two of the salient symptoms of his underlying skepticism. Another is to be found in his incapacity to be, in the ordinary sense, ingratiating. It is simply beyond him to say the pleasant thing with any show of sincerity. Of all his books, probably the worst are his book on the war and his book on the United States. The latter was obviously undertaken with some notion of paying off a debt. Bennett had been to the United States. The newspapers had hailed him in their sideshow way. The women's clubs had pawed over him. He had, no doubt, come home a good deal richer. What he essayed to do was to write a volume on the Republic that should be at once colorably accurate and discreetly agreeable. The enterprise was quite beyond him. The book not only failed to please Americans, it offended them in a thousand subtle ways, and from its appearance dates the decline of the author's vogue among us. He is not, of course, completely forgotten, but it must be plain that Wells now stands a good deal above him in the popular estimation, even the later Wells of bad novel after bad novel. His war book missed fire in much the same way. It was workmanlike. It was deliberately urbane. It was undoubtedly truthful. But it fell flat in England, and it fell flat in America. There is no little significance in the fact that the British government, in looking about for English authors to uphold the British cause in America and labor for American participation in the war, found no usefulness in Bennett. Practically every other novelist with an American audience was drafted for service, but not Bennett. He was non est during the heat of the fray, and when at length he came forward with The Pretty Lady, the pained manner with which it was received quite justified the judgment of those who had passed him over. 
what all this amounts to may be very briefly put in one of the requisite qualities of the first-rate novelist bennett is almost completely lacking and so it would be no juggling with paradox to argue that at bottom he is scarcely a novelist at all his books indeed that is his serious books the books of his better canon often fail utterly to achieve the effect that one associates with the true novel one carries away from them not the impression of a definite transaction not the memory of an outstanding and appealing personality not the aftertaste of a profound emotion but merely the sense of having witnessed a gorgeous but incomprehensible parade coming out of nowhere and going to god knows where they are magnificent as representation they bristle with charming detail they radiate the humours of an acute and extraordinary man they are entertainment of the best sort but there is seldom anything in them of that clear well-aimed and solid effect which one associates with the novel as work of art most of these books indeed are no more than collections of essays defectively dramatized what is salient in them is not their people but their backgrounds and their people are forever fading into their backgrounds is there a character in any of these books that shows any sign of living as pendennis lives and barry lyndon and emma bovary and david copperfield and the george moore who is always his own hero who remembers much about sophia baines save that she lived in the five towns or even about clayhanger young george cannon in the roll call is no more than an anatomical chart in a lecture on modern marriage hilda lesway's cannon clayhanger is not only inscrutable she is also dim the man and woman of whom god hath joined perhaps the best of all the bennett novels i have so far forgotten that i cannot remember their names even denry the audacious grows misty one remembers that he was the centre of the farce but now he is long gone and the farce remains this constant remainder whether he be actually novelist or no novelist is sufficient to save bennett it seems to me from the swift oblivion that so often overtakes the popular fictioneer he may not play the game according to the rules but the game that he plays is nevertheless extraordinarily diverting and calls for an incessant display of the finest sort of skill no writer of his time has looked into the life of his time with sharper eyes or set forth his findings with a greater charm and plausibility within his deliberately narrow limits he had done precisely the thing that balzac undertook to do and zola after him he has painted a full-length portrait of a whole society accurately brilliantly and in certain areas almost exhaustively the middle englishman not the individual but the type is there displayed more vividly than he is displayed anywhere else that i know of the thing is rigidly held to its aim there is no episodic descent or ascent to other fields but within that one field every resource of observation of invention and of imagination has been brought to bear upon the business every one save that deep feeling for man in his bitter tragedy which is the most important of them all bennett whatever his failing in this capital function of the artist is certainly of the very highest consideration as craftsman scattered through his books even his bad books there are fragments of writing that are quite unsurpassed in our day the shoe-shining episode in the pretty lady the adulterous interlude in whom god hath joined the dinner party in paris nights the whole discussion of the canon ingram marriage in the roll-call 
the studio party in the lion's share such writing is rare and exhilarating it is to be respected and the man who did it is not to be dismissed end of chapter three recording by linda johnson chapter four of prejudices first series this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. prejudices first series by h l mencken chapter four the dean americans obsessed by the problem of conduct usually judge their authors not as artists but as citizens christians men edgar allan poe i dare say will never live down the fact that he was a periodical drunkard and died in an alcoholic ward mark twain the incomparable artist will probably never shake off mark twain the after-dinner comedian the haunter of white dress clothes the public character the national wag as for william dean howells he gains rather than loses by this confusion of values for like the late joseph h Choate, he is almost the national ideal an urbane and highly respectable old gentleman a sitter on committees an intimate of professors and the prophets of movements a worthy vouched for by both the atlantic monthly and alexander harvey a placid conformist the result is his general acceptance as a member of the literary peerage and of the rank of earl at least for twenty years past his successive books have not been criticized nor even adequately reviewed they have been merely fawned over the lady critics of the newspapers would no more question them than they would question lincoln's gettysburg speech or paul elmer moore or their own virginity the dean of american letters in point of years and in point of published quantity and in point of public prominence and influence he has been gradually enveloped in a web of superstitious reverence and it grates harshly to hear his actual achievement discussed in cold blood nevertheless all this merited respect for an industrious and inoffensive man is bound sooner or late to yield to a critical examination of the artist within and that examination i fear will have its bitter moments for those who naively accept the howells legend it will show without doubt a first-rate journeyman a contriver of pretty things a clever stylist but it will also show a long row of uninspired and hollow books with no more ideas in them than so many volumes of the ladies home journal and no more deep and contagious feeling than so many reports of autopsies and no more glow and gusto than so many tables of bond prices the profound dread and agony of life the surge of passion and aspiration the grand crash and glitter of things the tragedy that runs eternally under the surface all this the critic of the future will seek in vain in dr howell's elegant and shallow volumes and seeking it in vain he will probably dismiss all of them together with fewer words than he gives to huckleberry finn already indeed the howells legend tends to become a mere legend and empty of all genuine significance who actually reads the howells novels who even remembers their names the minister's charge an imperative duty the unexpected guests out of the question no love lost these titles are already as meaningless as a roll of sumerian kings perhaps the rise of silas lapham survives but go read it if you would tumble downstairs the truth about howells is that he really has nothing to say for all the charm he gets into saying it his psychology is superficial amateurish often nonsensical his irony is scarcely more than a polite facetiousness his characters simply refuse to live no figure even remotely comparable to norris mcteague or dreiser's frank cooperwood is to be encountered in his novels he is quite unequal to any such evocation of the race spirit of the essential conflict of forces among us of the peculiar drift and color of american life the world he moves in is suburban caged flabby he could no more have written the last chapters of lord jim than he could have written the book of mark the vacuity of his method is well revealed by one of the books of his old age the leatherwood god its composition we are told spread over many years its genesis was in the days of his full maturity an examination of it shows nothing but a suave piling up of words a vast accumulation of nothings 
The central character, one Dilks, is a backwoods evangelist who acquires a belief in his own bunkum and ends by announcing that he is God. The job before the author was obviously that of tracing the psychological steps whereby this mountebank proceeds to that conclusion. The fact indeed is recognized in the canned review, which says that the book is a study of American religious psychology. But an inspection of the text shows that no such study is really in it. Dr. Howells does not show how Dilks came to believe himself God. He merely says that he did so. The whole discussion of the process, indeed, is confined to two pages, 172 and 173, and is quite infantile in its inadequacy. Nor do we get anything approaching a revealing look into the heads of the other converts. The Saleratus Sodden, hell-crazy, half-witted Methodist and Baptist of a remote Ohio settlement of seventy or eighty years ago. All we have is the casual statement that they are converted, and begin to offer Dilks their howls of devotion. And when in the end they go back to their original Bosch, dethroning Dilks overnight and restoring the gaseous vertebrate of Calvin and Wesley, when this contrary process is recorded, it is accompanied by no more illumination. In brief, the story is not a study at all, whether psychological or otherwise, but simply an anecdote, and without either point or interest. Its virtues are all negative ones. It is short, it keeps on the track, it deals with a religious maniac, and yet contrives to offer no offense to other religious maniacs. But on the positive side, it merely skims the skin. So in all of the other Howells novels that I know, Somehow he seems blissfully ignorant that life is a serious business and full of mystery. It is a sort of college town Weltenschong that one finds in him. He is an Agnes Replier in pantaloons. In one of the later stories, New Leaf Mills, he makes a faltering gesture of recognition. Here, so to speak, one gets at least a sniff of the universal mystery. Howells seems about to grow profound at last, but the sniff is only a sniff. The tragedy at the end peters out. Compare the story to E. W. Howe's The Story of a Country Town, which Howells himself has intelligently praised, and you will get some measure of his own failure. Howe sets much the same stage and deals with much the same people. His story is full of technical defects. For one thing, it is overladen with melodrama and sentimentality. But nevertheless, it achieves the prime purpose of a work of the imagination. It grips and stirs the emotions. It implants a sense of something experienced. Such a book leaves scars. One is not quite the same after reading it. But it would be difficult to point to a Howells book that produces any such effect. If he actually tries, like Conrad, to make you hear, to make you feel, before all to make you see, then he fails almost completely. One often suspects, indeed, that he doesn't really feel or see himself. As a critic, he belongs to a higher level, if only because of his eager curiosity, his gusto in novelty. His praise of how I have mentioned. He dealt valiant licks for other debutantes, Frank Norris, Edith Wharton, and William Vaughn Moody among them. He brought forward the Russians diligently and persuasively, albeit they left no mark upon his own manner. In his ingratiating way, back in the seventies and eighties, he made war upon the prevailing sentimentalists. But his history as a critic is full of errors and omissions. One finds him loosing a fanfare for W. B. Trites, the Philadelphia Zola, and praising Frank A. Munsey, and one finds him leaving the discovery of all the Shaws, George Moores, Dreisers, Singes, Galsworthys, Phillipses, and George Aids to the Pollards, Meltzers, and Hunnickers. Busy in the side shows, he didn't see the elephants go by. Here temperamental defects handicapped him. Turn to his My Mark Twain and you will see what I mean. The mark that is exhibited in this book is a mark whose Himalayan outlines are discerned but hazily through a pink fog of howls. There is a moral note in the tale, an obvious effort to palliate, to touch up, to excuse. The poor fellow, of course, was charming, and there was talent in him, but what a weakness he had for thinking aloud, and such shocking thoughts. What oaths in his speech! What awful cigars he smoked! How barbarous his contempt for the strict sonata form! It seems incredible, indeed, that two men so unlike should have found common denominators for a friendship lasting forty-four years. The one derived from Rabelais, 
Chaucer, the Elizabethans, and Benvenuto, buccaneers of the literary high seas, loud laughers, lawbreakers, giants of a lordlier day, the other came down from Jane Austen, Washington Irving, and Hannah Moore. The one wrote English as Michelangelo hacked Marvel, broadly, brutally, magnificently. The other was a maker of pretty waxen groups. The one was utterly unconscious of the way he achieved his staggering effects. The other was the most toilsome, fastidious, and self-conscious of craftsmen. What remains of Howells is his style. He invented a new harmony of the old, old words. He destroyed the stately periods of the Poe tradition, and erected upon the ruins a complex and savory carelessness, full of naivetes that were sophisticated to the last degree. He loosened the tightness of English and let a blast of Elizabethan air into it. He achieved, for all his triviality, for all his narrowness of vision, a pungent and admirable style. End of chapter 4 Recording by Philip Gould